Welcome to the You Can Man podcast, episode 10. I'm Josh. I'm Tim. And I'm Dave. And on this week's episode, Load Bearing Walls. All right, guys, welcome back. Dave, how was your week? It was great, but I want to talk about something real quick before we get going. Something that grinds my gears, okay, to steal a line from an old Family Guy episode. What grinds my gears is all of this hand, quote unquote, handcrafted stuff that's out there these days. You guys know what I'm talking about? I feel like it's every advertisement that gets thrown my way. Somebody is advertising their new handcrafted. I'll give you an example. I'm driving home from work today, and I and I've heard this. It was on the radio. I've heard this advertisement before. Uh, for Dunkin' Donuts handcrafted mm. iced coffee. And I'm like... So you're talking these big mega corporations slapping a name like handcrafted on something. For iced coffee. Like, I am somebody who appreciates handmade things that are handmade by a craftsman who knows what he's... Like, for example, <laughs> I, have a, I, have a, I have an axe at home that was made in Sweden by a guy who is a blacksmith. And it's beautiful. It's great. I never use it because I don't have a need for it, but I love it. And it's fantastic. But if your handcrafted cocktails, like, of course they're handcrafted. That's what bartenders do. <laughs> it's just driving me crazy because I feel like it's everywhere. It's just one of, sick the, of it. It's one of those buzzwords. And then you'll you'll be able to tell the advertisement in five years from now because it has that word. Well, it, right? I guess it's working because it's in my head. Right. But uh, it makes me want to buy this stuff less. Yeah. It's also vintage, too. That's that's another that's thing. One of the words. That, and how you know. how ridiculous would you sound? If you, you ordered go, a handcrafted, <laughs> yes, I would like a handcrafted iced coffee. And they're like, okay, they'd be I'll, like, I'll pour it in a cup. We don't know you. what you're talking about, and I'd be like, I know. <laughs> anyway, it drives me nuts. I'm sick of hearing about it. Okay, it's all the time. Handcrafted. I'll, I'll be on the lookout. Don't for that. use that around me anymore. Mass produced. <laughs> I can't take it. Yeah, I would prefer mass produced. Our mass produced uh, yeah. iced coffee. Uh, well, I did want to let our listeners know that I have started a new job. Okay, I seriously feel like I have like eight email addresses now. You're an entrepreneur. I'm trying to remember back on our very first episode, we, we talked about a little bit about ourselves, and you may have heard me mention that I'm a photographer, and I've been doing that for a long time A gifted now. photographer. Well, you know. Anyway, so kind of branching out and doing some different things, and I'm actually selling barbecue as like a side gig now, so just recently started that. An amazing barbecue place near us in marietta georgia righteous q it is barbecue. delicious it is awesome patrick the owner is a good friend of mine and he needed somebody to do uh catering sales so started doing that so that's uh what's up with me well, recently i have a question for you if like on a saturday if i want some barbecue but i don't want to go get it can i call you and be like hey tim can you bring me some barbecue no uh, so it has to be like a mass catering kind of deal yeah pretty much all right just order tons so of I don't, for you. So when I call you this Saturday, don't answer the phone. Yeah, I don't do anything really in store. I mean, when I say catering sales, I'm I'm not really doing anything with the barbecue. I'm I'm sitting behind my computer and answering emails and phone calls and that sort of thing. So working, man. But I actually I do want to I told Patrick, uh, the owner, that I do want to learn about, you know, all, everything, everything with the barbecue. So I think eventually he'll teach me how to do all They'll that. teach you the craft. Anyways, Josh, what you got? Nothing. Oh, that's Nothing. a shake of the head. Week. Slow week. That's Slow disappointing. Week. Yep. I well, think you have something, but you're just holding out. Mm, maybe. We, maybe. You did just go on a Bronco ride with me, and that was super fun. <laughs> yeah. Whoa, 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 whoa. I want to go. <laughs> yeah, uh, sorry. It's a two-seater, buddy. Uh, so my 1975 Bronco, it's been sitting in the garage all winter, and uh, this was kind of my first since the weather really yeah. got nice, fired it up. First time I got it out and dusted um, it off. Josh and I had a like a men's thing tonight, so I was like, "Hey, you want to ride with me?" And it was cute, and we got both got the Bronco the top down. <laughs> weather was out, yeah, weather was super nice. Two yep. dudes minus Dave. Winds blowing through my hair. Yeah, I did have to jump start it, but mm. now it the got battery. Us back. Yeah, now the battery's charged back up after it's sitting there. So. Anyways, well, I guess we'll just go ahead and jump into the topic, load-bearing walls. This is, some, this is a topic that is very near and dear to our hearts because well, Dave's a structural engineer, 
And doing a load bearing wall was kind of what really got me going doing a lot of DIY stuff on my house. You may have remembered me mentioning the story behind the name You Can Man was my good friend Julian who helped me a lot in my uh, on my home renovation. And he would always say, what one man can do, you can do as well. And that's where the name You Can Man came from. But the project that he helped me on the most probably was the load-bearing wall that we took out. And his insight was just invaluable. So when I thought about doing that project by myself, uh, you know, before I had before I knew how to do it, it was so overwhelming. But then having seen it done, it's doable for sure. Yeah, I remember uh, growing up, my dad took out multiple load bearing walls and he's an engineer as well. So he he knew the uh, important engineering that goes into a project like that. But just seeing him be able to, you know, bust through a cinder block foundation wall into this new addition that we had put on um, or take out, you know, a 15 foot span and put up a beam with a flitch plate, a steel plate up in the middle of it. As a kid, I just thought, hey, that's something that my dad's doing himself. So that must mean that's something men can do themselves. Well, I don't think any of us are going to say that it's um, that it's an easy job and it's a simple job. That it's we're not going to say it's a simple job because it's not. But, you know, neither of you guys are contractors or engineers. And both of you, all three of us have have done it uh, in either our houses or our friends houses. So. We're, you know, we're going to go through, we're going to go kind of walk you through the process, but, you know, we're here to say that with the, with the right help, this is something you can do. Yeah. And this is definitely a project where you're going to save a lot of money as opposed to hiring a contractor. So this is something, you know, it's debatable. We've gone back and forth. Like I I know in, in shows previous, like me changing my own oil. So a lot of guys are like, not worth it, not worth the time it takes, but I just enjoy doing it. So I do it. Um, the load bearing wall is completely different because it legitimately will save you hundreds upon hundreds of dollars, possibly thousands of dollars, possibly thousands. thousands. Dollars. Yes, because you got to think that taking out a load bearing wall, most people are going to feel so apprehensive about that, and they're going to think I've got to hire this out. Well, we're here to tell you that you don't always have to hire it out, right? Yeah, caveat there. So there are circumstances where, yeah, you probably would have to. So let me go ahead and paint the picture that we're going to do. So we're going to strip this down to just a very basic setup, right? So what we've envisioned is a a ranch house, mm-hmm. okay? It's on a crawl space, okay? And we've got a doorway, and we want to make that doorway wider. So basically a standard doorway, what, 32 inches, Yeah, maybe it goes in between your kitchen and your living room. Exactly. And we want to expand that doorway so that it's eight feet wide. Yeah. Right? Open the space up. And that span is, in our example, that span is going to go all the way to the exterior wall. Okay? Um, So, and I guess we'll get into this as to is this load bearing or not. Dave's going to tackle that. But that's that's our basic scenario. We've got a ranch on a crawl space. There's an existing doorway. I want to make that doorway from 32 inches to eight feet long. So I want to take out that wall. So how do I do that? So Dave is a structural engineer. So he's going to give us, in general terms, what makes a wall load bearing. Right. So this is step one. If you're going to take out a wall, you need to determine... If this wall is load bearing, if it's not load bearing and in most cases, the wall can just be removed. Uh, If it is load bearing, you we're going to walk you through the steps that you have to go through. But the first thing to determine is is if this wall is load bearing or not. And and the the easiest way that I can describe that is, um, is there any structure that is sitting on this wall? So what I've done, what I did at my house is I um, I bought a a little um, a scope camera on M- on Amazon for like $10 drilled a hole in my ceiling and I stuck this camera up inside the ceiling and I looked to see which way my ceiling joists were running. And I looked to see, you know, it, the way the ceiling joists are running, if there's which, which, whichever wall they're sitting on, that's the load bearing wall. Okay. Um, so if you have a ranch with 
no upper floor, you could poke your head into the attic. Correct. And, and look at the same thing. Look so, in the room that you're working on and see which way those ceiling joists are so running. So you're saying if the ceiling joists are running perpendicular. Ceiling joists, or in our case, the roof trusses. The roof trusses. If they're running perpendicular to the wall, then that right. wall is load-bearing. Right. And then another thing well, I guess we'd have to throw out there, too, is depending on the roof structure, maybe, Dave, you can take over from here. you probably explain it way better. But if you have a truss system, that's one thing. But then there's another building style that was used years ago that my house has, which I've just been uh, described as a, like a stick frame. Is that yeah? So you, getting into too much? I, th- I think so. There, you can frame roofs you know, a lot of different ways. I think probably the most common that people are going to run into, particularly in modern houses, are roof trusses. Uh, what Tim's talking about, uh, stick framing, is is a little bit different, but the concept is the same. If something is sitting on the wall, okay, if a roof truss or a stick frame roof is sitting on top of the wall, the wall is load-bearing. And, it, you know, we're probably going to get to this, but this is something that we would recommend that you have either an engineer come out and look at or a licensed contractor who has a lot of experience and knows what they're doing. Uh, get somebody out there like that to look at your house, tell you if this is a load-bearing uh, wall or not. Yeah, can't stress that enough. Uh, if you've got any doubt in your mind, you need to get a structural engineer out to look at it or someone who's done this, you know, five times, five, six times as really well-versed in doing this. Right, so th- so that's step one is determining if the wall is load-bearing or not. Tim, what do you have over there for step two? Yes, so the next thing that we're going, so we're assuming that, yes, I've determined that this is, in fact, a load-bearing wall. So the next step is I got to figure out what other things am I dealing with that are in that wall? Yeah. So, and it's not going to be like you see on um, on TLC where you know you determine you have a load bearing wall, so then you just start taking a sledgehammer to it and start working through that wall. Bad idea. Uh, you're going to need to yeah understand. Let's let's figure out what's going on inside this wall before we go taking it out. Is there any electrical? Do you have any outlets on that wall? Do you have any light switches on that wall? Is there any plumbing that runs? Is there is there a plumbing stack that, that runs through that wall uh, that's going to cause you trouble if you just go breaking through the wall? There could be uh, HVAC equipment like ducts, returns, um, supply vents, uh, any gas lines. There's all, all sorts of utilities and components in your house that could be inside that wall. So we need to determine up front what's going on behind these walls now in a lot of ranch houses especially older ones like a couple of us live in you can kind of see what's going on and if you can locate your bathrooms you you know you can with some know-how you can understand what's going on behind those walls right in that scenario that we painted of a ranch on a crawl space your electrical should all be really relatively easy to get to because it's either going to be coming up from the crawl space provided you have a crawl space that's easy to crawl around in or it's going to be coming down from the attic. Mm-hmm. I was just thinking, Josh, where you said, yeah, maybe this wall is between the kitchen and, say, the dining room. So we know for certain that there's chances are good. There's going to be at least one light switch sure. that I'm going to have to move. So you'd think through, well, i got to move this to basically the other side of the frame of where it's sitting now. So those are some of the things that you really have to think through. If you've got an HVAC return, well... That's fine. You can you can still have it relatively in the same spot. You're just going to need to have it be a return that goes into the floor. Mm-hmm. So those are the things that you really have to think through. And then to Dave's point, with the little um, what do you call it? the the scope? Yeah, the scope camera. Yeah, the scope camera, and you plug into your phone. They're super cheap now, so you can get that. Poke some holes in the wall and and take a look around before you jump into that. Yeah, the hardest thing would probably be if you ran into plumbing inside the wall. I agree. I think that is. Um, you really need to decide if this is really a wall you want to take out because plumbing becomes um, very complex to, to relocate. Yeah, I think that's something that you're probably hiring out if you have to relocate plumbing. If, yep. you, if it's a light switch, in my opinion, that's easier. I don't like dealing with electricity, but I think that's easier than, than the load-bearing wall removal itself. So if you have to move a light switch, not a huge deal. Absolutely. Most walls I've taken out usually have one light switch, maybe an outlet, and a couple times I've run into like a return vent. Mm-hmm. Um, but those were all easily relocated by myself or a professional. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So now we've got that established. The next thing would be the actual demo. 
Uh, so we're by demo again. We mean just taking off the drywall. So we're we're not taking out any structure. The only thing I'm doing is taking off the drywall on that wall, and that will really give you an excellent idea of what is yes. behind the wall because you're taking all that off. One little quick note about um, demoing drywall. I don't know if you guys do this or not, but you know you watch HGTV and they just take a sledgehammer to it. Don't it's do for that. Dramatics. It really yes. is, and it it creates way more dust. Now we'll say this. The first hit, yeah, go go for it, go for it. You know, if you <laughs> have, want to have just a little like, fun, yeah. If you if you if you know, like, okay, the studs are here, and I can just like kick straight through this wall, that's kind of fun. I'm probably punching it. I think for the first one, yeah, the ceremonial punch. But what you want to do when you're demoing drywall, I want to minimize that dust, so I want to take out the biggest piece that I possibly can at one time, right? Instead of breaking it into a million pieces. Mm-hmm. Tim's so, a clean worker, oh, well, aren't so, you? Well, he I don't is. Know. He's the best. I I, I waste a lot of time like stopping cleaning I would and then get back into it. But anyways, it just helps me mentally. <laughs> but one thing, yeah, I was gonna say when you're taking out drywall, score the the tape between the ceiling and the wall because if you don't, then you might rip into the ceiling drywall. And that'll mess it up, and then you got to deal with that. That's a pro tip. And then the same thing goes where uh, the wall meets the the other wall. Any corners. In any corners. Sorry, that's a a way better (laughs) way of describing it. Anyways, just wanted to throw that out there. So next thing. Use that utility knife. Exactly, yes. Score the tape, and it'll come out a lot cleaner. Um, The next step, temporary walls. This is huge. That's a critical step. Yeah, this is the one where... This gives you the physical security and the peace of mind that when you remove this wall, this load-bearing wall, that you're not going to cave in the house on on yourself or your family. Right. So what we're talking about is, um, in most cases, on either side of the wall. So I think we said the kitchen side and the living room, the living room side. You're going to actually build at a probably two by fours. Uh, a temporary wall on either side of the wall that you're taking out a few feet away from the wall on each side. Uh, so you have room to work. Um, but it's, it's a, a temporary wall that you're going to build to support the structure. So these two walls will basically mirror the look of the existing wall that's there. So if you can, I know this is a podcast, but if you can visualize, you have the main wall you're taking out. And if you mirrored that wall on each side, that's kind of what you're building, and it, so you have three walls for for us. And you don't you don't have to build it the same length as as the actual wall that's being removed, but you do need to build it as big as the opening. as big as the opening or a little bit a little bit bigger. Yeah, yeah I was going to say that I always tend to build the temporary walls just a little bit wider yep. than my opening, just in case one of those ceiling joists lands at a weird spot. Definitely, and then I'll have support because I made it a little bit longer. And we talked about this, I think, before the podcast. When I do temporary walls, I just do pressure fit. So it allows me to not put any holes into the the ceiling drywall. So what I mean by pressure fit is I'm literally throwing a two-by-four on the floor, and then I'm putting a two-by-four up on the ceiling, and I'm pressure fitting two-by-fours to sandwich in between those the bottom plate, the top plate. It is a difficult thing to, to describe on a podcast, but hopefully you guys get an understanding. Yeah, so of he's that. building a wall basically without using any screws or nails. He's using the, yeah, sorry, the pressure yeah. of the ceiling essentially to hold his studs in place, the studs of the temporary wall. What I've done in the past is we built, built the wall on the ground. So built the actual wall, tipped it up into place, and then hammered it, friction fit it mm-hmm. vertical. Yep. multiple right. Multiple ways to do it. You can pressure fit it. You can use nails and screws if you want, just whatever you're comfortable with. Yeah, the bottom line is this thing needs to be as structurally sound uh, temporarily as the wall that you're taking out, Mm -hmm. right? So you want to support the structure. So if you have any doubts about the structural integrity of the temporary walls that you're building, stop what you're doing and fix that before you proceed. As with every step along the way here. If you're not comfortable, consult someone who is comfortable. Yeah. Okay, moving right along. The next step, once you've got those temporary walls down, you feel really good about it. The next big step is taking out the actual structure of that load-bearing wall. So you're going in there and just you're demolishing all the studs. So you're taking all that out. Yep. So you can do it the clean way. You can use a Sawzall and, and 
cut out the studs, cut out all the nails. You can try to sledgehammer all the studs out. It's totally up to you. But once you have those temporary walls in place, you can just go at that old wall and, and get it out of there. That's right. T- uh, Josh mentioned the clean way or the the dirty way. Is there a Tim way, a clean way? Uh, That's to what take the out the, are. you know, usually I feel like I know I just take a big hammer and and just knock just knock things. it out. Now, if you do that, then the you're you're still going to have to get the saws all in there because there's going to be nails poking down where mm-hmm. when they did the initial framing. Mm-hmm. Uh, they would have done the nails from from the top going down. Does yep. that make sense? Yep. So you're still going to have to cut those nails off. I was going to say, think through, and this kind of ties into our next step about building the actual beam. You would have already heard from your structural engineer or good friend that's done this a lot. You need to use this size beam. So we're not really going to touch on that. You've got to figure that out ahead of time. However, the size of that beam and how far down, like the head space you want, may determine whether or not you take out the top plate and by the top plate i mean the the horizontally laid two by four that is structurally part of that wall so like the vertical two by fours you're taking out right but you may choose to leave that top plate there yeah so you know what, what what tim's talking about is there are two ways that you can um frame this opening that you're making in your wall you can do what we call a flush beam which is where you put your new beam up inside this up inside the ceiling and that basically creates a um an opening without a wall above it okay the, the ceiling would be smooth from one room all the way into correct the or you can do what's probably a little bit easier is a, a dropped beam or a header that's down below the ceiling which is like any doorway that you would walk i shouldn't say any doorway but most doorways that you're going to walk through in your house mm-hmm. yeah that's what i'm getting at i guess thinking through how far down whatever size beam I need needs to come. Yep. And that might determine. And that deter- that determines the look. And people have, I think, strong feelings about that, whether they want it to be a very open look or a more traditional cased opening. Now, Tim kind of touched on this real briefly, but the uh, the beam or the header that you're putting in place of the wall that you're taking out, sizing that is very important. And getting somebody who knows what they're doing to size that for you is critical. Yeah, on episode, what was it, eight, we had James on two two episodes ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, we took out two massive load-bearing walls. Uh, I don't want to say massive, but they were, they were sizable. Large span. And we had Dave come over and look at it, and he did actual calculations and figured out, okay, you need this size beam. So we cannot stress enough that you can't just say, well, I think a 2 by 10 would be a good, good size for that. No, you really got to think it through. And do the math yep. and get somebody that knows what they're doing to size that beam for you. So that is, you know, part of the expense. Like you may have to shell out a, a few hundred dollars to have a structural engineer. But keep in mind, I mean, you're going to save so much money doing doing the actual work yourself that it's so worth paying a structural engineer to come in and do that. Yeah, there's um – and this is kind of big picture for the, a project like this, but if you're if you're taking out an eight foot section of wall or putting in a beam that's going to cover an, an eight foot opening, that's going to run you into the multi thousands of dollars if you were to hire a professional, depending on complexity, but easily into the thousands either way. Whereas if you're doing it the, yourself and you maybe pay a few hundred dollars to an engineer, you're only you're literally only paying another few hundred dollars in material in most cases. Huge yeah. savings. Huge I mean, savings. On you got to think about it. You've got the the two by fours for temporary walls, not much at all, and then the actual beam, which for you know an eight foot span in a in our scenario, you're likely going to be able to do that with two by tens probably. But again, caveat: you got to get you got to get those calculations down. But I think for our example, it's probably like two by tens. And then you'll have to, of course, sandwich a uh, half inch piece of plywood in between those two two by tens. And that is simply for the purpose of padding it out to where it's the same thickness as the wall that you're taking out. Yeah. So you're taking you're taking out a wall that is made up of studs, which are typically two by fours, which are really three and a half inches deep. So your, your wall is three and a half inches deep. So the beam you put in there needs to take up that same amount of space. And in order to do that, you put two 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 by pieces of wood together with a half inch 
piece of plywood that brings you out to three and a half right. inches. Right. So a two by ten actual dimensions are an inch and a half by what is it? Two by ten is like nine and a quarter. Nine I and think. a quarter. Nine and a quarter. So inch and a half, inch and a half, three inches, half inch plywood total, three and a half inches. So, <laughs> so that takes us into the next part, which is actually building, actually building the beam. So we've, right. we've demoed out the wall. Now, yep. what are we putting in its place? Yeah, Dave, you wanna you wanna take that? Sure. So uh, once you've determined the size of the beam, it's um, in in walls that I've done. Uh, we've do, I've done you know several different sizes, but we'll use a, a case. That I did recently, which was three two by twelves. Uh, we we bought the two by twelves, cut them to length, screwed them together down the length of the member with the appropriate amount of screws. Your engineer or um, experienced contractor can help you with that. Um, and that's when you know we built the beam on the floor, lifted it into place. What about what about glue? What do you guys think about that? I've never negative used, never used it before because I'm just thinking. Look, if it ever. If it never fails. That ain't going to do anything, yeah. anyways. Not on beams. Glue I use it is, on subfloor. That's, that's a bad. It's it. a bad idea. What What you're going for here is uh, the the plies. Okay, so each individual two by, uh, in this case, three two by twelves. You want to make that into one member. Okay, you want to your by you you, was, you would really want a, a beam that's made out of a single piece of wood. That's the same dimension as your three two by twelves, but that's very expensive. So we use individual two by twelves to build this member up, screw it together, and then you have a member that's acting together. If you were to glue that together, those three pieces, that is not going to create a one sound member. So right. glue is a bad idea. And uh, glue it, and in this case, gluing it and screwing it, kind of not. It's kind of redundant. At, right? at, They're not redundant. It's whenever, just as an engineer, as an engineer, whenever you guys say glue, I just cringe inside. <laughs> what a little, about, a little well, bit of me dies. I use I use glue on subfloor. Yeah, which that's is different. So that it yes. doesn't lift. Correct. Anyway, that's different. Not not this topic. All um, right. And a quick note: Look, do not use cheap screws. Okay, do yeah, not use cheap screws. I love, and I'm just exclusively using the GRK. Same. Same, yes. Because I've used other brands that are sold at the big box stores, and I have, I've i run through a box where I've snapped every tenth screw. I've just snapped the head off of it. Of yeah. a construction-grade screw is what they call it. But GRKs eat fa- eat through wood faster. They, they drill in well, easier. Well, they have the, um, it's like a self... Um, Self tapping or yeah, that's not that's not the right word. Um, Self drilling. I Self drilling. Mean, yeah, they everyone claims they have that, but the GRKs for whatever reason. I mean, it's because of the, the yeah, we'll they're put, the best. But they, yeah, we'll uh, put a link. Legit. We'll put a link on the show notes on the the general construction screws that we recommend. Yeah, yeah, GRKs. Okay, that's so it. we've at this point, well, what have we done, guys? <laughs> we we have determined that it's a load bearing wall. We have determined the HVAC, the electrical, the, all this stuff that Anything we're going to... Anything that needs to get relocated. We're going to have to move, right? Then we did the demo of the actual drywall. Then we built our temporary walls. And then we built our actual beam. Well, okay. we built our temporary walls. Now, we cut we cut the, the opening, the, the existing opening. We, we made it larger. Yep. And now we've built our beam. Yep. Okay. But before we really build the beam, I've got to know how wide it is. And how wide it is is going to be dependent upon where my king studs are josh explain to us what you're like looking at me like i gotta do that yeah i'd rather have dave do that okay i would i would okay i'm gonna give my explanation and then dave will give his structural engineer explanation basically the king studs are the termination points where that determines the total rough opening no, 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 that's not right at all. <laughs> no. It's, it's hard. Where, it's where the, yeah, on a podcast trying to explain it. Um, on the show notes, we will definitely put a, diag- a basic diagram of this is the king stud, this is the jack stud. But the king stud is where the, uh, the header is actually touching, right? And then what's holding up the header, right. we'll talk about next, is the jack stud. Now, that's a little bit more descriptive because it's a jack. But anyways, Dave, I butchered that. Save me here. So you have your header. It is going to sit on your... It depends on what type of look you're going for. If you have a flush beam, your, uh, and that's where the ceiling is consistent you know, from room to room, your header or your beam is going to sit just on posts. If you have a dropped opening, so where you have a wall above you know, where you're walking through, 
You're going to have your header. It's going to sit on jack posts. And then just outside of your jack post, you're going to have your king studs like Tim mentioned. So the king studs go all the way up. The jack studs or the jack the jack studs um, support the actual header. Yeah, that's a much better way of explaining it, for sure. <laughs> all right. So, and again, we're not going to, there with all of this, there are so many details and your situation may be different. We're trying to use a very broad um, explanation or a broad scenario for um for building these, but yeah, every situation is different. Yeah. And I should have mentioned this earlier too. I do in fact have a YouTube, uh, episode or yeah, I've done, I've done, I've got all of like at this time that we're recording, I have all of like three YouTube videos up on our, you can man YouTube channel. Like don't feel, you got to start somewhere. Yeah, right. No. Come on. Uh, I got like 2000 views on that first one. It's so, huge. Um, anyways, I address you'll, you'll watch me take out a load bearing wall. Now I only had load on one side of the wall and, uh, some roof load coming down, but anyways, watch that video and you'll, you'll get a better visual as to what we're talking about. Yeah. Here. So as we, as we finish up talking about the King studs and the Jack studs, which is, the, the ends of where the ends of the beam sit, um, you again need to consult a professional about what's below that yes. column, yes. Or the, the post that that the beam is resting on. That's what extreme, is directly below that. Right. That's extremely important. We call that tracking your loads down. So you need to track your loads down all the way down to the foundation where you have down to the dirt, down to the dirt, down to the earth. Mm-hmm. Right. So. In our case, I think we said we were on a crawl space. A yeah. lot of times you will have a, uh, a beam underneath your wall. Inside, the, the beam's actually in the crawl space. Um, you need to make sure that this um, is adequately supported all the way down to the foundation. Right. And in our scenario, we, and I should have, this should have been a sub point, really, when we we're trying to determine if it's a load bearing wall, because I got to. You got to make sure that I can carry that load all the way down, like Dave's saying, to the foundation. So in our scenario, we go in the crawl space and we see, yes, in fact, there's a pier with a beam directly up underneath where our load bearing wall is. OK, and then we're actually taking out all the way to the exterior wall. Well, that's taken care of because that's the foundation wall. So in our scenario, we're taking care of, but every situation is different. And so you've got to make sure that that load is carried down below yep. the load bearing wall. S- slabs are different if you're on a slab. Um, we're not going to go into huge detail, but oftentimes a slab isn't thick enough for a, for a post just to terminate right on the slab. Dave, do you want to add anything to that? That's right. A lot, it depends on your situation, but most times you're going to need a, a footing underneath um, underneath your post, underneath your, your king studs and your jack studs. Does that just mean making that concrete thicker in that spot? Correct. So slabs are generally too thin to support any appreciable amount of load. Mm. Um, the, That's good to know because a lot of folks may think, myself included, years ago, that this slab, it's concrete. Yeah, it's, so it's immovable. Like, we're good to and, and it is very strong, but when you get concentrated load on a very small area, it can it can punch through that slab. So when we say thicken up that slab, we're talking about making a footing. So you would basically cut a hole in the slab dig down and pour a footing that's deeper than the slab. And that may make you rethink taking that wall out. It that may, sounds, but it is it is doable. That sounds like a lot of work. Yeah, I'd, same with you, Josh. I would have never thought about that. I would just be like, oh, yeah, it's concrete. I don't need to do anything. It's totally yeah. fine. Yeah. But if it's only four inches thick, well, that load is probably going to crack Especially the Especially on a multi-story concrete. house, um, you could have some problems. For sure. Okay, so next step, we're actually going to install this beam. Now, this is really a three man job. Safely, yes. I've done Safely. it with two with two people, and <laughs> so I can tell I. you from experience, it is a three man job. <laughs> I did the last one myself, so there's that. Whoa, however, okay. All however, right. it wasn't it wasn't eight feet long, and I actually ended up building the header in place. Mm-hmm. Um, it's advanced. If you watch my YouTube video, you get to see me do that. Um, but yeah, really, to do this safely, it's a three man job. You want to have two guys on either end of the beam. And then the one guy in the middle, that's a you know support, and he's maybe taking your jack studs and then hammering those up underneath the beam so they're nice and tight. Mm-hmm. So definitely probably a three-man job. Okay, after we've got that beam in, it's finally time to take out our temporary walls. So uh, you want to make sure that you've got everything screwed down properly. 
I've got the jack stud tied into the king stud, the king stud tied into the, the beam. I've got maybe the beam tied into my ceiling joists. And these are all with high grade construction screws. And at that point, then we can finally take out our temporary wall. Yeah, so when those walls come down, that's your finished product. Um, and if the ceiling doesn't cave in on you, you've likely done a good job. And if you've done your homework and consulted the right people, you're in good shape. I can't agree more, yeah. Uh, get get qualified people out to, to help you, either help you out or to um, approve what you're doing. Uh, but this is something that, that can be done by people with right know-how. Yeah, this is it's such a game changer in your house. I mean, you can't think of any other project that creates that much change in your house. And you doing it yourself is going to save you so much money. So we really do feel like learning how to take out load bearing walls is something that is incredibly valuable. It's worth the time invested to think it through and do this yourself. Yeah, again, the, the savings involved um, are massive. They can be massive. Uh, and there's going to be some touch-up work. You know, you're going to have to touch up your floor where the old wall was. You're going to have to touch up the ceiling where the old, wa- all, old wall was. You're going to have to relocate any of those utilities. Um, all of that may sound overwhelming, but it's really not. We've, we've all done it. We all, the, the three of us here, have done it for the first time and, rem- and remember that time. And it's not as daunting as it may sound if you have the right help. Yeah, and definitely a satisfying project for sure. All right. I think that about wraps up our load-bearing wall discussion. We'll definitely be doing some other shows uh, talking about load-bearing walls in the future. After the break, it is Dave's week to bring the bonus segment, so we have no idea what he's going to say. Stick around for that. This episode is sponsored by 1776 United. 1776 United is a patriotic and historically inspired lifestyle brand. They make the best patriotic shirts and apparel on the market today. I personally own many of their products, and if you want to don patriotic gear without looking gaudy, check them out on Instagram, Facebook, and at 1776united.com. All right, guys, welcome back. Dave, your week. Take it away. It's my week. It's my segment. The title of this week's segment is called You're Doing It Wrong. Mm, okay. 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 So now that I have a platform, okay, and I have a captive audience, I guess it's not a captive audience, but I'm going to go through, through some things that are, for the most part, everyday tasks. The first one's not an everyday task, but most of them are that I believe you're doing wrong. Okay. 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 Right. You guys ready? Hit me. First are these one. your opinion or have you researched these topics? These are my opinion and fact. Okay. So here we go. And we'll Number be the one, judges. you will be the judges. Number one, using a metal file, also called a bastard file. I always feel weird calling it that. <laughs> really? I've never heard it. Really? Heard that. That, yeah. Heard that. That's what it's called. All right. We're going to look that up, and if I'm wrong, you're going to edit that out. <laughs> okay. Using a metal file, okay? I believe that most people use it incorrectly. Josh. Walk me through the process of using a metal file. Let's say you've cut a pipe, okay, and you want to knock the burr off of that pipe, and you're going to use a file to do it. How do you use that file? It's our, you sorry, got, Josh. You got he, he asked no, you. I don't sorry. even know which. I, don't I was going to ask you a clarified question. So you, this is specifically for knocking the burr off of a cut, say, copper pipe? That's the what? first thing that came to my mind. Um, and that's I've used it for that before. What I'm getting at is when you use a file, the way that it should be used is you take the tip of the file, put it on the medium that you're filing, and run the file across in one motion. One motion, one and, direction. In one and direction, lift it up. then lift it up. We agree on that. And repeat the process. So I've seen people, and I in the past, have used it like a saw, back and forth, in a back and forth motion. That is not the way to use a file. Amateur hour. Okay, and I got, I got a, a tongue lashing when <laughs> somebody saw me do that. They were like, what, that's not, what are you doing? Anyway, so I was schooled. That's number one. One that reminds me of that is uh, sharpening a lawnmower blade. Yes, that's a um, great y'all, y'all example. Do, y'all do not want to see how I sharpen my lawnmower blades. <laughs> you, Sam, you're doing it wrong. Oh, well, no, you, you run the, you run it. It's kind of like sharpening a knife. You actually run it down from the tip of the blade down the down the side of it. I would agree. Not 
the other way. Not well, agree. Whatever. Not your, not your motion <laughs> towards the pointy. This is a correct correct way to this do it. This is a Tim. great thing to describe on a podcast. We'll, we'll walk you through it, Tim. Counter- okay. Uh-huh. Number two. Po- Tim, post a link to a, a video of someone using a file correctly and sharpening a mower blade correctly. I should do a video of me sharpening <laughs> my mower we'll, we'll, we'll do that. We'll do Tim doing it incorrectly, and then we'll have either me yeah. and Josh. I don't use the file, guys. Oh, I'm I use the angle grinder on that, Josh. You can, you can do that. You can I do that. As as you, you can do that. Disc. You can't heat it up too much because you'll ruin the temper of whatever it is you're doing. But you can do that. Have you seen my yard, Dave? I mean, <laughs> I'm not talking about <laughs> using an angle grinder. I'm talking about using a file. Anyway, that's okay, number one. Number sorry. two, parking your car on a hill. Tim, do you have a process that you go through when you park your car on a hill? Okay, so in my Bronco, I don't have a parking brake because I took it Let's out. Let's talk about your Toyota uh, Sienna. Okay, Sienna. I would say while I'm still in drive, so I'm going up the hill. Okay. Going up the hill. Apply the brake, normal brake. Yep. I put push in the emergency brake before I put it into park. So what I'm saying is I've got my foot on the brake. I then push in the um, emergency, emergency, emergency brake. brake. The parking brake. Parking brake. And then I put it into park because that way it ensures that the weight is on the parking um the, what am the, I, why am I? The I'm, parking I'm gonna tell you, the parking break. I'm going to tell you what you're trying the, to do. I, th- I still think you're doing it wrong because you're missing a critical step. So what am I missing? In my opinion, when you park your car on a hill, uh, the, this is an automatic transmission, which is 90 percent of 98 percent people out there. But you come to a stop. OK, you have your foot on the emerge on your on your regular brake. Um, you put your you apply the parking brake. Well, okay, so let me back up. You That's come, exactly what I just hold said. Hold on. Right? Let, me, let, let, me, let me get through it, okay? You come to a stop. I say you put it in neutral. You have your foot on the brake. You put it in neutral. Put the car into neutral. Apply the parking brake. Take your foot off of the actual brake. So then the only thing holding the car on the hill is the emergency brake, the parking brake. Then you put the car into park. If you do it Tim's way, I'm telling you, when you put it into drive, you're going to feel that ka-clunk. You're going to feel the car shudder no. because you have the car being held on the hill by the transmission. No. Yes. Because you have to take your foot off of the off of the brake. No, because I, I would have applied the parking brake before I put it into park. I know. But you, when you put it into park without taking your foot off of the actual brake, even though you applied the parking brake, you still have the transmission holding it on the hill. Tim, this is my segment. I'm right <laughs> and you're wrong. OK, moving uh, on. You, no, no, no. We're not moving on. <laughs> oh, snap. Josh is calling me out. Are you, are you with me, Josh? None of this matters. It does matter. First of all, um, cars are designed in a way now that you can just put it in park on a hill using the parking. Mm. Using I disagree. The, uh, the transmission. Holding it on like the hill? It do, like it doesn't. That's what they're yeah, designed. The pure, but force, pure, but yeah. purely that clunk that you get when you put it into drive, after you've done that, it just... A great time. Okay, number two. If you are in San Francisco, Oof. it is the, a law, yeah, okay. a city law, to cut your wheel into the curb. That is a great thing to do. That's, okay, but so I would say that that, that, pointing, that is born out of manual is, transmissions. It is, but it's still a thing. If you're pointing downhill then and they're on the right side of the road, then you cut your wheel to the right to to cut your wheels against the curb and if you the other way if you're going up the hill on the right side you turn the wheel to the left to so you'll go into the curb so and that not the car street. would roll yeah your that's car a great would roll point against the curb that's a great point uh anyway. i i agree moving on we got to keep the segment going okay so that was number two number three what you're doing wrong wondering which side of the car the gas tank door is on. Mm, okay. This is pretty common. It is pretty common. Now, when you're driving your own car, you know what side the gas tank door is right. on. But if you're traveling and you have a rental car, you may not know which side it's on. Tim. There's always an arrow. There's usually always an arrow when you look closely. Usually always. And you're, you're right. There is an arrow. Now, yeah. I believe that a lot of people do, not, the, do where, not know about this arrow. Where is this arrow? Okay. So when you're sitting in your car and you look at the fuel gauge, there is an arrow. I think it's usually a triangle. OK, and it is indicating which side of the car the fuel door is on. I believe a lot of people don't know. Yeah. 
Maybe they. Uh, I've I mean, seen this I on the think... internet called a life hack, and I'm like, that's just a thing. Yeah, like, that's you should know. a li- life hack. That's stupid. <laughs> well, or is... you could just use a side view mirror. And just... No, I was, so I checked it today if in you're preparation. Smooth, some of them are smooth. Yeah, you can't see my fuel door on my car. So I think what happens is a lot of people pull up to the pump and they get out and they look and they're like, oh no, it's on the other side. Anyway, you're doing it wrong. That was number three. <laughs> number four, replacing your razor every two to four weeks. Oh, this is just so near and dear to my heart. <laughs> I think it is for all of us because we all do it the correct way. So I for people, will, we'll watch don't it. Use a razor. <clears throat> Hold on, I seriously, I use like two razors a year. Tim, I have been using the same razor for at least four years. I've never, okay, I haven't good, replaced good. it. So for people that this don't is a know, shout out to Clark Howard. It is Clark Howard. This is born out of Clark Howard. I think he, for our listeners our that don't know, Clark Howard is a, a, a local, but nationally syndicated, syndicated radio talk show host, financial big, expert, financial expert, expert, consumer, a favorite advocate. advocate. Yep. Right. So years ago I heard on his show, um, that you need to dry your razor off. He didn't really go into the nitty gritty. I'm not either, but it's not the act, the act of shaving that dulls your razor. It is a wet blade that dulls your razor blade. So very simple. If you dry your razor off after you use it, you can essentially use that razor for, I'm not going to say forever, but I've been doing it for four years now. I think women have a, a harder time with this because they tend to leave razors in the shower because yes. they shave their legs in the shower. If you're if you're a lady, you got to take that razor out of the shower whenever you're done with yep. it. But for guys, it's easier because we're usually doing it at the sink. You can dry it off when you're done. Use it forever. I've I've heard him recommend even um, hitting it with rubbing yes. alcohol first to yep. make the water evaporate faster. Yep. Uh, also, he says he's done this research that if you look at like a Costco blade under a microscope it is not different than the Mach 12 razor I'd believe you're that I believe yeah. it so that was number 4 last one number 5 unpeeling a banana you're doing it wrong so <laughs> but every, Where are we es- going? essentially <laughs> everybody unpeels it from the side with like the stalk you know the long What hair. do you mean unpeel it you mean peel it <laughs> Yeah peeling it <laughs> Oh man I'm doing it wrong <laughs> Yeah you are I'm pronouncing it wrong so peeling a banana taking the peel off most yeah. people do it from the side with the stalk if you watch a monkey do it I'm told <laughs> they do it from the opposite side and I I can attest to the fact it's much easier really from the, from the bottom, bottom it, it peels much easier i also read one time that it, you don't get those strings that's not true <laughs> but it is much easier to peel it from the from the bottom it comes apart easier it's quicker because i feel like whenever i do it from the stalk end it always gets oh, real yeah. mushy at the top yeah. do it from the bottom pull it apart it opens super easy i'm told that's how monkeys do it i got an honorable <laughs> mention also this is not number six honorable mention Pronouncing the word asterisk, okay? It's asterisk, it's not asterisk, and it's not asterisk. And it's not asterisk. It's A-S-T-E-R-I-S-K, asterisk. You're doing you've it wrong. Hold, you've been holding that we one. I have. I, I've been holding that one, and it drives me crazy. Nobody says it correctly. Could do a whole show on, on pronunciation. Yeah, so that was my honorable mention. Anyway, guys, you're doing it wrong. All right. Dave, that was a that was a solid segment. Appreciate it. Keep that one around. I, I, like I think that was a good one like for sure. You, can, you yeah. can add to it. So there are a lot of things that you probably believe people are doing wrong. Can I make a request that you do the um, You Can Man trivia on your next segment? We can do. We can bring back You Can Man trivia. That was, I think, a pretty big hit. Uh, it was a lot of fun. If you haven't heard, I think that was on episode three. Go back and listen to it. It got yep. it got heated. <laughs> yeah, you get to watch or listen to me and Josh totally draw a blank as to the main components of concrete yes yeah the three components had to go it was a little bit disappointing but we got through it all right that's going to wrap up this week's show guys thanks so much for tuning in please take some time to subscribe to our show on apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts i did want to mention that we have a q a uh, campaign going uh, you may have mentioned if you follow us on instagram that i posted a photo that says ask us anything and so we really mean it. Ask us any question you want. And then what we're going to do in the future is do, and this will be like an ongoing thing. We'll do a Q and a show where listeners will submit their questions. So if you want to leave us a comment on our Instagram photo there or any Instagram photo, any post that we make on the Facebook page, or if you want to email me, Tim at you I'll check it there. And if you're really brave, you will do a voice memo 
on your phone and then email us the file and then we could even play that on the show. Nice. So as I always say, check out our show notes, youcanman.com. Check us out on Instagram and also our Facebook page. Till next time. Bye.